all these superheroes, they have origin stories, right? And this summer, people are learning about Wonder Woman's origin story. Uh, here we are in Baltimore. And when I arrived, uh, I looked out of my uh, hotel room window, and I saw uh, the roundhouse for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And here we are working in rail public transportation. And rail public transportation, uh, it has some superhero qualities, right? It moves about 20 million people uh, every day in this country. It creates the shape of our communities in many places. Uh, and so it's really uh, an important sort of superhero. It may not be made into a movie, to be fair, but uh, it's really important to our communities. And the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, I think as some of you know, is really uh, the first railroad in the United States that offered what we would think of today as commuter rail service. So here we are at the superhero origin site for the industry in which uh, the people at the After Rail Conference are working. And at the time they went about building the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, uh, it was, a, it was a challenging moment for Baltimore. They saw that uh, some of their neighbors up and down uh, the road were building canals. And so in Baltimore, uh, officials both uh, at the city level and people in the private sector, they got together. They had a daunting problem. They created a public-private partnership. They went and they looked around the world and they found a new technology, an innovative technology uh, that could help serve their community. They invested in rail, the first rail line like it in the country. And they addressed a challenge and they came up with a good solution. And it's really the predecessor to a lot of the work we do today. But obviously over the last 200 years, we've innovated a lot. There's new propulsion technologies and new operating technologies and a lot of new handheld technologies for our passengers that uh, recreate uh, our industry right now. And so listening to Kevin Quinn this morning from the Maryland MTA talk about the changes that they're making in Baltimore to make the Baltimore Link effort successful uh, was just a reminder of our constant need to reinvent and to rethink what we do in innovative ways. And there are ways to do that in the area of financing, the way we carry out safety, the way we carry out service delivery. And I do wanna thank, uh, really on behalf of all 500 people at FTA, uh, all of you for your uh, support and interest in our good work uh, in recent months. And I wanna thank uh, Doran Barnes and Dick White uh, for being good partners communicating with me uh, during 2017 as we work to move the federal public transportation program forward. There are a lot of new opportunities for us. One of them is the safety field. Uh, at FTA, uh, we have moved forward building out a safety program that's described in federal statute. So uh, during the past year, or a little more than a year, we finalized the state safety oversight agency rule. We updated it. We finalized the FTA Public Transportation Safety Plan program rule. That's done. We are also in the process of updating some other rules or issuing some new rules. So Secretary Chow has made clear that for USDOT under her leadership, safety is her top priority. And it is often the case during a new administration, there are rules that we are looking at to determine how to proceed with. One of them is a rule that affects our transit operators. It's the public transportation agency safety plan rule. And that's a rule that uh, we are actively working on. Uh, we hope to have more to say about that in the coming months. But my message for all of you is that we are aware of uh, a number of the pending rulemakings that you're interested in. We're working to move those forward. Uh, at a recent DOT celebration noting the 50th anniversary of the Department of Transportation, uh, Secretary Chow was talking about some of the changes that have occurred in transportation in the last half century. And for us, um, we are in the original sharing economy, right? As we talk about a lot of the innovation that takes place in the space around rail public transportation, we're in the sharing economy, the original sharing economy mode. The federal definition of public transportation is, uh, to paraphrase, shared rides uh, available to everyone in the public, right? So there's shared rides available to everyone in the public. And our mobility on demand sandbox effort at FTA uh, has been a way we've partnered with the industry, with both our grantees, with private firms, to test out uh, some new concepts uh, in public transportation so that when your passengers are approaching their train or departing from their train, uh, they can seamlessly integrate uh, the options, whether it's for a fixed route transit trip or a bike share or a car source service or an e-hailed taxi or uh, TNC. We're working with all of you to roll out those concepts, and we think there's some uh, good ideas that we're gonna have a lot more to say about in the near future. A few weeks ago, 
uh, Congress passed and President Trump signed the 2017 funding for the Federal Transit Program. And I think at this point, many of you know that that funding, it closely follows uh, the FAST Act authorized levels for 2017. It includes uh, important funding for our programs that give you some reliability in, in going forward with projects. And in the coming days, FTA is going to issue the apportionment notice that makes those funds available to our grantees so that they can use those projects effectively. Uh, one of the interesting things is that in recent years, we've seen our grantees able to boost uh, the federal transit specific appropriation by using flexible funds, right? So if I told you you could boost the federal transit program funding by almost 10% a year, you'd say, well, how can I do that? And many of you do that successfully by flexing funds from the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program or the CMAC program. Uh, I know it's not always straightforward to do that, but it's important in your communities that you pay attention to those opportunities because they are a way to boost the resources for your public transportation investments. And then also in recent weeks, during the month of May, uh, the White House released the President's proposed 2018 budget for the Federal Transit Program. And for transit, uh, the federal proposal is for $11.2 billion. And what that includes is funding levels uh, for the trust fund side of our program that largely follow the FAST Act. Uh, for rail operators, it means about a 4% increase in the urbanized area formula program. It means about a similar 4% increase in the uh, State of Good Repair Grant program. So those are important, uh, again, markers as you head into fiscal year 18 for your formula programs. On the capital investment grant side of our program that funds new starts, small starts, core capacity projects, the President's budget does propose important changes. Uh, the President's budget proposes completing our existing full funding grant agreements for existing projects and then starting in the fiscal year 2018 budget, we would not propose funding for new, new starts, small starts, core capacity projects. And I've been in conversation with many of you about this and the President's budget proposal and how it might affect uh, approximately 60 bus and rail projects uh, seeking about $20 billion in capital investment grant funds uh, for uh, about $40 billion in total investment. So capital investment grants have been proposed as a little less than half the funding for projects that are planned in what's called the pipeline for capital investment grants. And uh, Dick White, uh, APTA leaders, uh, they've been articulate and clear with me about the industry's position regarding our proposal. And what I'd tell you at this time is that uh, how we're managing the pipeline of projects. So for projects that are in the capital investment grants development pipeline, we are continuing to follow the statutory framework for project advancement. Uh, we're working with project sponsors, for example, when they're doing the planning work, uh, when they're completing environmental reviews. Likewise, uh, when a project meets the statutory uh, requirements and FTA readiness requirements, we are moving projects into the project development phase and the engineering phase. When we do that, we are making clear to project sponsors that they are undertaking uh, the additional work, uh, their planning work, environmental work, recognizing that capital investment grant funds may not be available for those projects, right? That's, that's clear given the President's budget proposal. In parallel with our work on the capital investment grants program, there is a White House infrastructure investment initiative that's underway. And our intent there is to develop a comprehensive proposal that will accelerate projects, it's gonna spur investment, both on the private sector as well as the public sector side, with the goal of helping prioritize and modernize a lot of infrastructure improvements. And Secretary Chow has highlighted that this is an infrastructure package which should be released later this year, and it's gonna include a targeted program of investment. I think you've all heard that we are targeting a trillion dollars, $200 billion in federal investment. Uh, in addition, last week, uh, the White House highlighted that about 100 billion of those dollars would be targeted for locally prioritized projects, infrastructure projects. And at the Federal Transit Administration, our team has been contributing to that infrastructure investment effort. Uh, we've identified opportunities for streamlining projects. We've looked at regulatory guidance policies that could uh, be streamlined to deliver projects more effectively. And to take full advantage of these changes, uh, many of you 
have shared your insights with us as well. That's been quite helpful. Uh, what I'd tell you today is that on Friday, uh, when President Trump and Secretary Chow and Interior Secretary Zinke were at USDOT, one of the things we rolled out uh, was a federal register notice. And what we're doing there is we are now formally seeking uh, public comment on uh, rules at DOT, uh, policy statements, guidance that we've issued across the operating administrations that uh, might uh, unjustifiably delay or prevent completion of transportation infrastructure projects. And so you, if you've shared comments with us before, that's been helpful. This is your opportunity to share those comments formally with us. Uh, the period for comments is open through July 24th. And I think that will be helpful uh, for all of us at FTA if we have input from our grantees, our stakeholders, highlighting those areas where we might make improvements to our program to avoid unjustifiable delays that can prevent completion of projects. Um, I will highlight uh, one other area uh, where I want to make sure we're making progress. And this is in the area of state safety oversight program certification. Uh, I'd be remiss not to raise this. So as you know, uh, there's a deadline that was really set in motion back in 2012 by MAP 21. And it's arriving in less than two years. So by April 15th, 2019, uh, state safety oversight agencies have to have their program certified by FTA. They have to demonstrate that they have the legal capacity, the technical capacity, the enforcement authority to carry out uh, enhanced safety oversight responsibilities. And for any state, there are 30 states that are covered by this provision. If there's any state that doesn't meet that April 15th, 2019 deadline, FTA will be unable to award uh, any grants in that state, not simply for rail operators, but for urbanized area grantees, for rural grantees, for planning, research, and the like. And so we've been providing extensive technical assistance to the state safety oversight agencies. We actually gathered them here in Baltimore a little more than a month ago for one of our regular meetings to make sure they have the tools to go forward. We've provided them with a toolkit, but in some cases they're going to need support from other stakeholders. There are 10 of those 30 states where legislation must be enacted for the SSOA to deliver a functioning state safety oversight program. And so we'll need support from the industry making the case uh, for that work. I would just like to close noting that at the Federal Transit Administration, the 500 people who work there, we don't own a bus, we don't own a train, we don't have any construction equipment. We get everything done uh, in partnership with all of you. And so I really want to thank uh, each and every one of you for your good work with us now and your good work going forward as we look for innovative ways to deliver projects, smart ways to finance projects, technologies that we can use to benefit uh, our transit customers. So thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. And now I'd like to introduce our second or our next federal partner in the railroad space, uh, Patrick Warren, he is the executive director of the Federal Railroad Administration. It's a pleasure to be here with Leanne and, of course, Matt, um, a good partner of mine and a good partner uh, inside of the federal uh, uh, government with us. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dick and Doran for inviting me here and uh, letting uh, Matt and I have this opportunity to talk to you all. It's really uh, quite a privilege and important uh, discussion, I think, into the future. So I look forward to the Q&A right after we get going here. So um, as we, as we uh, start out the day, I want to uh, uh, say that um, I'm really pleased uh, that with working with APTA. It's a multi-faced advocacy research and standard setting activities that it does. Um, and, it's part, and our partnership with them is important to the FRA and to the Department of Transportation. So I applaud all of you who are members of it and also uh, the agency itself. Um, the message I want to deliver today is one, of, um, one about strategy and synergy and partnership. It goes without saying that FRA and FTA um, are extremely committed to supporting APTA and its members. But I do see uh, multiple opportunities for further strengthening and linkages among our commuter railroads to achieve uh, efficiencies, whether implementing PTC or successfully addressing the other challenges where resources are limited. So um, 
let me start off by saying that the commuter and intercity inter passenger rail um, are vital elements of our nation's intermodal transportation system. Overall demand and use of passenger rail is increasing, and you're all to be applauded for uh, that increase. New uh, corridors are being planned, new rolling stock is being procured, and operators are increasing the frequency of service to accommodate the demand. In major metropolitan areas nationwide, commuter rail and transit are the backbone of regional and, and local economies. And intercity rail provides an increasingly viable alternative to highway travel, and, and, the, and air travel for that matter. And that's a triad that, uh, that is important to remember as we go forward because all three of them are needed in our nation, um, and we're just looking for best value, and rail is certainly a big piece of that and should be, continue to be promoted. For decades, federal highway and, uh, and transit programs required state and metropolitan planning organizations to evaluate potential um, economic community and environmental impacts of transportation programs, examine past trends and future pro um, projections for travel, demand for people, goods, and information, and address societal issues such as community values and goals. Um, in recent years, to support this effort, FRA developed a, uh, a complementary framework for rail corridor planning at the multi-state and local levels. States and, lo and localities understand the value of integrating uh, multiple transportation modes in congested corridors and in developing a pipeline of well-coordinated rail infrastructure projects. Their demands to achieve seamless interconnectivity between inner city and commuter rail, transmit, uh, transit systems, and airports reflect this goal to provide the travelers expanded mobility options. Um, Infrastructure development is important, and you just heard a lot from Matt about that. But right now, it's a, a very important time and a very valuable time for the group uh, that's in here because the administration is um, beginning to solidify and, uh, um, its ideas about infrastructure into the future, and it's now time to be heard. So if you, uh, it's a good chance to get your voice into the process and let uh, the administration know what you're thinking about, what would help you, and don't miss this, uh, this moment in time, I suggest. Let me spend a minute now talking about positive train control. I know there's been several forums on it um, over the last few days, um, but it's an important topic and worth mentioning one more time. As most of you know, 28 of the, of the 41 railroads implementing PTC are passenger carriers, including Amtrak. In addition, there are three new start operators developing systems now. The statutory deadline for PTC implementation is just 18 months away, which is a blink of an eye. And uh, while not yet fully operational um, pro uh, uh, across the network, uh, uh, progress is being made. Many railroads have successfully uh, completed implementation planning and system development. However, there are still others that have a ways to go. FRA will continue to support commuter railroads as they advance system development and testing and, and to obtain certification and full implementation. Wayside equipment has been installed in over 30% of uh, the track segments, which, is 20, which equates for 20% for the passenger um, uh, industry. Over 40% of the locomotives are equipped with PTC hardware, and half of the radio towers used by passenger railroads have been installed. So this is good progress, but uh, again, there's just 18 months left to complete. Also of note, just over a week ago, the department announced that 17 projects in 13 states are receiving a total of 170 $197 million in FTA grant funding from Congress authorized in the Fixing America's Surface Transportation or FAST Act. Selected uh, grantees are using these funds for installation of back office systems, wayside communications, onboard hardware, and spectrum um, acquisition. As Secretary Chow stated in uh, announcing the selections, the intended outcomes and benefits of the funded projects are more um, accelerated implementation, increased interoperability, and improved reliability of PTC systems across the country. Um, th um, we need to understand, though, that there's a variety of systems that are being deployed by, we understand, FRA understands that there's a variety of PTC systems that are being deployed by commuter railroads 
um, which, increase comp which in greatly increase the complexity. However, our hope and expectation is that APTA member railroads will actively seek to uh, achieve um, efficiencies by collaborating with each other whenever possible. Also of importance, we are encouraging all stakeholders to start now to uh, look ahead um, into the future. One of the key issues for commuter uh, railroads to consider is that PTC will require more maintenance than uh, um, traditional signal systems, and FRA suspects that current funding structures have not been adjusted to address such increased costs within the various railroads out there. Now, let me uh, turn to the subject of uh, human factors, uh, specifically efforts to combat employee fatigue and um, issues with drug and alcohol abuse. I'm um, talking with employee fatigue. Employees ha um, know, uh, here know that railroads um, operate 24-7, 365 days a year. This uh, state of continuous operation places extraordinary demands on infrastructure, equipment, and most of all, operating employees. Accident investigations, regulatory compliance oversight, and research has shown conclusively that fatigue degrades on-the-job performance and fitness for duty. As we have all seen, um, all seen all too often, the consequences of fatigue can be catastrophic. FRA, together with you, the railroads, have made considerable progress in the past few years, um, in decades actually, in, in addressing railroad employee fatigue. Research has shown that fatigue is a multifaceted uh, condition affected by emotional environmental um, variables such as sleep loss, workload, stress, aging, health, medications, and many other factors. The railroad work environment often uh, lends itself to, uh, to in inducing operator fatigue. Moreover, individuals tend to underestimate the effects of fatigue on their own performance, as we are generally not good judges of our own um, tiredness. To be clear, the problem of fatigue goes beyond uh, amendments to hours of service laws and regulations. Adherence to those laws and regulations may reduce, but not eliminate the underlying conditions of fatigue. Current hours of service requirements are generally based on theories of that fatigue um, accumulates in a linear progression. This is a, the longer, and that is the longer the amount of time the person's at a task, the greater the risk of fatigue. That said, uh, but this approach does not take into account other factors such as the amount of sleep someone had, loss of quality of the sleep, or the type of task that's being performed by the operator. As uh, required by the Rail Safety Improvement Act of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that void um, is what led to the requirement for the, for the fatigue risk management program, which um, provides a systematic uh, basis for addressing the challenges of, the, of this dynamic um, problem. As required by the uh, Rail Safety Improvement Act of uh, 2008, RISA, FRA uh, continues to draft a regula uh, regulation requiring railroads to develop and adapt a fatigue risk management program as part of a larger system safety program. Each railroad's fatigue management program will be unique, reflecting the operational conditions and needs of its employees. They should be developed jointly by management and labor and then socialized with your workforce. Central to this uh, is a strong safety culture where individuals are encouraged to report errors, problems, and hazards so that information is used to prevent recurrences um, instead of being a trigger for disciplinary action, which is pretty important. Overall, robust fatigue uh, risk management program offers um, to, co to conduct railroad operations more safely by providing greater flexibility and relying solely, um, rather than relying solely on statutory requirements. Let me just say a bit about drug and alcohol problem that's out there right now and its prevention. Another criti critical era, um, issue right now is America's opioid um, abuse crisis. Opioids include um, opiates such as morphine, codeine, and heroin, and now synthetic drugs such as oxycontin or oxymorphine. The medical profession has begun to address uh, overprescribing uh, over by providers and uh, the doctor shopping by individuals. Um, the rail industry has witnessed a rise in positive drug uh, test results for marijuana corresponding to the commensurate and more permissive um, state laws that are uh, out there right now. 
Unfortunately, the consequences of these trends are evident in higher railroad employee positive drug uh, results uh, and in accident trends. And that's the most alarming part of the accident trends. While the random testing, and this is the random testing uh, rates, um, are, are up by 1%, which is not necessarily as dramatic as you might think. That's 1% in 50,000 tests um, over the past five years. The post-accident positive test rate is up over 7%. So you know you can you can do the math there and figure out the people are figuring out how to avoid it in the random test, but they are. But when we go to an, get in an accident, we're finding that uh, that the employees are are using some kind of drug. Since 1986, FRA has uh, required pre-employment random, reasonable suspicion, and post-accident drug and alcohol testing of certain rail industry employees. Current pre-employment uh, random and reasonable suspicion uh, testing relies on the Department of Health and Human Services five panel test, which does include marijuana, cocaine, opiates, amphetamines, and PCP, um, but does not uh, currently um, include uh, the synthetic opiates and tranquilizers and muscle relaxers. Now, we'll say that um, just recently, the Department of Health and Human Services did um, add to its panel the, um, those, the new opiates, the synthetic opiates, but it has not yet been adopted by the um, Department of Transportation, but that rule is going forward right now. And additionally, it adds um, one other factor. It allows oral fluids um, testing methods. So that, that is a change also that uh, will hopefully be, you'll see in Department of Transportation regulations soon. Um, adapting testing requirements and programs to the rapidly changing uh, substance abuse environment is challenging. To prevent uh, impairment of railroad employees uh, in safety sensitive jobs, FRA has uh, long promoted awareness, deterrence, detection, rehabilitation, and recovery from um, illicit drug use and alcohol dependence. Our work has included outreach using uh, model programs such as Operation Red Block, providing technical assistance and training materials, conducting compliance oversight, and when appropriate, um, taking enforcement actions, which is really not our favorite thing to do. FRA is unique among DOT uh, operating uh, administrations because our regulations require railroads to offer employee assistance programs for voluntary self-referral and co-worker reporting of substance abuse. We understand that the uh, commuter railroads do not generally have the resources that the large freight railroads do, but uh, to devote to drug use and alcohol prevention programs. However, these employee assistance programs have um, been shown to be a huge force multiplier um, and we highly encourage uh, the commuter railroads to um, continue to improve those programs out there because they really um, uh, are a, an advantage to the, uh, uh, deterring the problem. Um, last thing uh, I'll, I'll uh, mention is collaboration. And in each of the areas I've discussed, PTC, fatigue, uh, and addressing uh, drug problems, um, there are potential opportunities to leverage resources among yourselves. Commuter uh, railroads are not in competition with one another, so uh, you are more able to share and leverage experiences um, and more effectively and efficiently um, handle the problems together. I understand that last year's meeting, uh, there was a, uh, a presentation from APTA's um, task force on member collaboration. In that spirit, I strongly encourage you all to identify potential uh, synergies, cost efficiencies, and economies of scale to improve your return on investment. Um, this may take, some, uh, take the form of sharing uh, non-proprietary information uh, and data on PTC, system certification, on, on loaning key personnel, perhaps loaning key personnel to one another um, to solve your problems. Similarly, sharing detail um, about the railroad's success in adopting fatigue uh, risk management programs may go a long way in helping the industry improve. I encourage you to consider all functional and um, operational areas where uh, yet to be identified lessons learned and best practices are disseminated among APTA members. Um, and just the last thing uh, I'll bring up, and we brought up about infrastructure, um, uh, but just uh, to reiterate a point is that um, if you're looking to do a project here in the next in the future, and you've heard, and Matt did a great job of talking about the programs uh, that are out there um, with the FY17 and leading into the FY18 budgets that are that's being proposed, but if you're not thinking about um, the, the five to one ratio that the uh, president and administration have, have talked about in terms of um, 
uh, how you go about fun funding the project, you're probably not um, in the ballpark of, of getting your project where you want it to be. If you're not thinking about public-private partnerships and other um, uh, tax incentives and loans, as well as grants um, and uh, other revenue streams to, uh, to go with whatever um, the federal government can uh, kick in with grants, you're again probably not um, in a position to um, uh, have your project favorably looked at, uh, or at least at the, prioritized at the top of the heap. So think about those things as you go forward, and it's an important time. Again, it's a time for your voice to be heard out there. It's a, a time for you all to work together and um, to achieve a greater uh, efficiency and effectiveness as we go uh, into uh, 20, uh, finish 2017 and go into 2018. So again, thanks for your time, and uh, thanks again to Dick and Dorn for time to talk. So we're going to move into some Q&A now. Um, thank you both for your comments. Uh, I think they were very helpful, insightful for all of us to hear from you today. Uh, it's a little hard for us to see if anyone's actually yeah. standing at a mic with a question. Um, so I think maybe I'll dive in with one uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So someone might actually have to sort of wave us down or if we can turn the house lights up a bit or something, I'm not sure. Um, so building off a couple of things I think that some of you, both of you touched on, um, the Trump administration seems to be emphasizing the connection between transportation investment and development growth and development opportunities. Are there efforts underway uh, in either of your respective spaces to sort of boost transportation real estate connections and, and how can we sort of play better in that space and, and take those opportunities? Yeah. I'll, I'll take a shot at that. So, in the infrastructure, in the White House infrastructure investment effort, we have been talking about revenue streams, financing streams. For public transportation agencies, uh, they have revenue streams, uh, they have system revenue. It's not sufficient to cover, obviously, all operating capital expenses, that's why we're in the public sector. But it's very clear that there is value that our investments unlock, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'll give you the example of the Navy Yard where USDOT is located. Uh, the development that's occurred around the Navy Yard in the last 20 years is really quite notable. Uh, there's a ballpark, there's USDOT headquarters, uh, there's a new emerging business district. The causal factor for that was the Navy Yard Metro Station, and uh, my understanding is in, in the district, for example, uh, the Green Line, uh, the stations along the Green Line and the real estate in proximity, maybe within a half mile of those stations, is going to be responsible for something like 70% of the real estate revenue growth in the entire District of Columbia over the next 20 years, but that revenue doesn't flow back to public transportation. And so we've talked about approaches that might, uh, at the federal level, uh, incentivize or encourage uh, that, uh, that use of uh, transit-based uh, you know, revenue, but it's a supremely local action, right? So those real estate actions and real estate revenue are supremely local, but we've thought about how that ties together. Uh, at FTA, uh, we have funded a TOD initiative that provides technical assistance both to uh, the, all of our grantees, but also we've done some targeted technical assistance. So we've done some uh, technical assistance for transit-oriented development, both for bus rapid transit projects, uh, but also for a number of uh, rail projects. I think in uh, Tacoma, Washington, for example, in Oklahoma City where they're planning a line, we should have another round of uh, technical assistance uh, planned for a request for proposals in the fall. Uh, likewise, we have uh, the TOD uh, pilot program that was created uh, and, and is funded at $10 million a year, and we'll be soliciting proposals for that TOD tech, uh, pilot program as well. Uh, maybe one important program to note is the TIFIA program. So for the TIFIA program, uh, we recently uh, awarded a loan to Bellevue, Washington. This is a really interesting project. So it's a loan to Bellevue, Washington uh, to do uh, pedestrian improvements, to do transit-oriented improvements in anticipation of the East Link light rail project. So uh, DOT provided a $100, $100 million loan to Bellevue to make transit-oriented improvements in their community. In addition to that loan, uh, there is, as many of you know, a provision that was in the FAST Act that allows US DOT to make loans for real estate investments in proximity to uh, commuter rail and, and transit 
And so there's an opportunity to have the federal government participate in the financing of transit-oriented development and transit projects in the future. Pat, did you have anything you yeah. need to jump in with? Yeah, just sort of to, to uh, elaborate a little bit more on what Matt said is that one thing is, is that if you can talk about the, you know, using numbers statistically, how, uh, whether your railroad um, has, uh, through its uh, current operations, really developed a community um, and the economy around one of your stations, or uh, as you're looking to develop, if you can um, talk about what your projections are and how you achieved your projections in terms of some kind of metric in improving the economy around where you want to do your expansion, you are um, really going to uh, have the dialogue that is of interest, I know, to uh, the Secretary of Transportation. She's very much into understanding how it's going to benefit the community with some statistics. So, um, as, as uh, Matt just said, the idea of, of the restaurants and the hotels and the businesses that are in and around um, and will be connected through uh, your expanded rail service if, the, if you have the numbers to go with it, you're going to go a long way. So I'd like to encourage anyone in the audience, if you have a question, there's, I think it's four mics around the room, so feel free to uh, stand up and uh, flag us down if we don't actually see you. But I don't see anyone. Okay, we'll continue. I've got, I've got questions. I've given some of this some thought. Um, so what are some new ideas uh, and service options do you see coming out of the Mobility Sandbox program? So Leanne, uh, FTA uh, has put together uh, some of our research dollars to support grantees trying out new things with new technologies, uh, a, lot of, a lot of them handheld technology related. And for rail transit providers, uh, one of our observations has been that rail transit, high capacity transit lines, are kind of like the Amazon River. And a lot of the new entrants into the market, a lot of the new services that are available really exist in the ecology around those high capacity transit lines because there's such a density of trips that are generated, right? So that's where you find the bike share programs, the car sharing programs, the e-hailing taxi and car services. So it's really an opportunity to solve that first and last mile problem. Uh, last year, FTA did give out, uh, I believe it was 11 grants, about $8 million uh, for what we called our mobility on demand sandbox demonstration projects. And in a number of communities, we're testing out uh, different concepts. We really wanted to you know, hold hands with the industry. It's a sandbox, right? It's where you learn new things. Um, and, and so we are going forward, uh, for example, uh, a paratransit effort in Pinellas, uh, Florida, mm -hmm. Pinellas County, to look at uh, how we can provide paratransit service effectively, partnering with taxis and TNCs. Uh, there are projects uh, where we are looking at how to uh, use transit during off-peak periods to provide service that might otherwise be provided by higher cost fixed route service while providing an equal or maybe higher level uh, of service uh, in proximity to uh, you know, late night work sites, community colleges, for example. Okay. This is probably. <laughs> yeah. 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 We, we, are, we are looking forward to, to continuing that mobility on demand dialogue with all of you. Uh, we have people from our research uh, office here this week, and uh, there are some sessions where people are going to be talking about their projects. Okay. So, Pat, how does FRA see its role in ongoing development of inner city passenger rail corridors? So, um, it's, a, it's a big, uh, uh, a huge interest to us. Um, first of all, uh, different than the FTA, we do not have a, uh, a, a guaranteed funding source in the, in the in the railroad in, uh, world. So our, our money comes from appropriations that occur every year by Congress. So because of that, we have to be pretty strategic and we have to be looking ahead uh, with you, partnering with you, um, to figure out how to sell and help you sell where um, it is best to invest in, uh, in rail. And so the corridors are one of the big areas that we, what we focus on. And there are, of course, several in the nation that, that are you know, fairly well designed, like divined, like the Northeast Corridor, the Southeast Corridor, and others. But um, we, wor we, work with, we, want, we work with the states, we work with you, in order to try to find the synergy so that, that when, because your voice together, where two states or two communities or two uh, metropolitan areas or more um, come together, 
you um, have a much better opportunity to sell the project and also explain why it's of greater value to the, to the nation. So we have, um, uh, we, we work with the states, we work through not only AASHTO, but through APTA, and um, to, to develop these corridors and to work with you with a dialogue in order to come up with um, feasible plans, help you come up with feasible plans together with your state partners to, um, uh, to describe what you need to be done, uh, what could be done in the future in those corridors. So um, it's a, a big part of what we do, and it's a big part of what we uh, encourage you to do and in terms of the corridors. Oh, yes, I see a question. Could, could you walk up to the mic so the rest of the audience can actually hear you too? That's helpful. Thank you. Could you give us an update on the Northeast Corridor future? The, sure. Um, the Northeast Corridor future um, is, uh, for those who don't, aren't from the Northeast, is um, essentially an environmental impact study um, for uh, going from Washington, D.C. all the way up to Boston and, and how to uh, improve the corridor for um, into the future. And it's, uh, so we've com largely completed the environmental impact study uh, and we put out a um, preferred alternative last December. Um, it, uh, we hence received a lot of um, uh, community feedback. Uh, we've gone back and taken a look at that and we're now um, getting ready to um, uh, to put out our record of decision. So uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's currently being reviewed. Um, we're going through some final, final edits and tweaks and hopefully we'll have it out in a not too distant future, but I can't uh, exactly tell you the day. Um, but I, we do know that it is um, an important document that will help um, all of you who are on the Northeast Corridor um, and those who, who have uh, commodities that move from your area into the Northeast Corridor um, to improve uh, your economic viability and economic viability of that region over the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years. We have another question back there. Hi. I was wondering, uh, given the last campaign uh, for the presidency, much was made about the uh, crumbling infrastructure in the United States. Um, has the Trump administration directed the FTA or FRA on uh, how to properly address that and additional funding to correct that problem? Sure. Yeah, the, the backlog, so FTA provides sort of a physical exam of public transportation on a biennial basis. We do it in partnership with FHWA. And the backlog of investment for public transportation is about $90 billion today to bring transit assets up to a state of good repair. And that was talked about a lot during the campaign. It's a conversation we have regularly in the transportation, public transportation industry. And the White House Infrastructure Investment Initiative is certainly an effort to identify resources that can help, uh, ident can help buy down that backlog, that can do it effectively by you know, reducing barriers to completing projects. And there are a number of different things we've been looking at as part of that Infrastructure Investment Initiative. We've been looking at uh, projects that could be ready to go forward. We've been identifying policies, regulations at DOT that we might streamline to help with project delivery. And there is an effort underway to identify funding and financing resources uh, that could help uh, address that. So uh, just last week, the White House uh, provided some additional information. As Secretary Chow has noted, a, a complete plan will come out later this year. But the administration last week highlighted uh, of the trillion dollar investment plan uh, where some of the dollars would be directed. And for example, there's $25 billion that would be directed towards rural infrastructure needs, uh, another $100 billion that would be directed towards uh, urban, public tra urban transportation or infrastructure priorities. So there are, there's a need we've all identified. There are plans that we are developing that we'll be sharing in more complete detail uh, to address that backlog and the reinvestment needs. And I'll just add that, um, so as, this, as the administration came into um, being they asked uh, for lots of input from the modes, so FDA, highways, us, FRA, and um, and we provided that input all along the way, and it's asked every day. So it is. So they, the administration knows um, what we know. They've taken our advice, and they're they're factoring that into what they're doing. And and again, your advice and your thoughts are important to put forward to the administration as we continue to. Um, uh, 
develop this infrastructure package um, and whatever it's ultimately going to be. And of course, um, you know, the, your congressmen and your senators, et cetera, have a vote in all that too. So, so, so uh, um, our voice is out there and your voice is important too. Okay, I'll ask another question then. We've got a few minutes, there's no one down there. Uh, I think this is probably more to Matt, uh, focusing on sort of workforce development. Uh, through the innovative grant program that the FTA has worked to, hard to actually really move the needle on workforce development, what are your plans to ensure that it remains a priority? Uh, Secretary Chow, in addition to arriving at DOT, with a lot of knowledge of transportation, arrived at DOT as a former eight-year labor secretary. And I think that's been evident in our dialogue with her uh, during the first half of 2017, where she has a real interest in workforce issues uh, for the nation and right now for the public, for the transportation sector. Uh, we have, I can't remember, is it 70 more million people joining the country in the next quarter century, and we need to figure out uh, how to deliver services to everyone, how to ensure there are jobs, how to ensure people are trained for all the technological changes, all the issues that we saw up on the screen this morning during the opening plenary, the things that are facing us in the future. And for the federal transit program, there are a few different ways we come at that. Uh, there is uh, the National Transit Institute. Uh, I was talking to Paul LaRousse uh, earlier today. It's the 25th anniversary of the National Transit Institute programs that provide training for many members of the transportation community. But in addition to that, uh, at FTA, we have provided about $20 million in recent years for uh, an innovative workforce training program uh, that trains people throughout the transportation industry, frontline workers, for example. And Congress in recent years had not appropriated uh, or authorized uh, the funds in the right way to allow us to go forward with that. Uh, we think we may have an opportunity with the FY17 appropriation uh, to go forward. And then the last thing I'd note is that the FAST Act, 18 months ago, made a really notable change. It allowed FTA grantees to use one half of 1% of their formula funds for workforce. It totals about $76 million across the country. It's distributed among our grantees, and we've been brainstorming ways that uh, we might support grantees in using that, those resources at least some of it in some pooled manner where you'd have an economy of scale and be able to do a lot of workforce training or curricula that could benefit uh, transit agencies. Just to, uh, to add on to that, um, while the Federal Railroad Administration doesn't have um, funds or airmark funds for workforce development, we have done several surveys and we continue to update them every year and we, and it's, we post it on our website for the rail industry to look at um, issues and places where you can um, uh, develop things and ideas and, and is, that are out there to help develop your workforces. So every year we update that. So if you're, if you're sort of curious of what's out there, whether you have an aging workforce or whatever your issues are, you can take a look at that and there's some ideas about how um, to go about uh, improving the, your workforce. I think we have a question in the audience. Yes, hi, I'm uh, David Cameron, Teamsters Rail Conference. In 2009, uh, Congressman Oberstar proposed a half a trillion dollar infrastructure and spending package with 50 billion going to high speed rail. Trump has talked about a trillion dollar infrastructure package, which now turns out to be a $200 billion infrastructure package to entice another 800 billion for infrastructure. What's the reality of that? <laughs> are you, well, if, you, if you're talking about high-speed rail, um, right now, uh, you know, there's still about uh, $10 billion worth of effort going on with regard to high-speed rail, uh, most of that in California right now. There are some, um, the administration is looking at um, other ways or to get high-speed rail, to introduce high-speed rail into, the, um, into our nation. Uh, right now, the Japanese are, have a, um, uh, a program that they're looking at to put in high-speed rail between Dallas and Houston, um, largely funded by them, although there may be loans involved by the United States as opposed to grants. So, um, so there are other ways to get at problems and other organizations that are problems, you know, uh, ways to improve rail out there. 
Uh, and um, so, so for, for regard to high-speed rail, those, those programs are still in place and they're still going forward. Um, I think that to really the short, an um, the short answer to your question in, in writ large about uh, the difference between 200 billion and, uh, you know, and the 800 billion from private industry is that there are probably um, lots of organizations that would put forward um, more funding if in fact they could get to their uh, uh, more streamlined process they can get through some of the red tape, some of the, the challenges, uh, the expenses of some of the early development um, of those of, you know, environmental impact studies and some of the other permitting that goes with it. So, it's, so as uh, was mentioned earlier, there's a lot going on in trying to reduce costs um, that, that de-incentivize industry and, go and local governments from in investing their own money into, a, into uh, infrastructure. So I think that um, this is a chance to rethink how we're um, looking at uh, funding um, national systems, national rail systems in this case, um, and um, come up with some innovative ideas. And, and again, if you know barriers out there that are causing you problems, you know, it's a time to raise your hand and, and, and help us identify them so that we can uh, reduce them if possible, and then hopefully um, uh, use that $200 billion to kickstep those programs that. Uh, um, that you all want to do. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the proposal, right, it recognizes there's a need for public side investment. It also highlights that there is private equity that's out there that could help us with our infrastructure. And the infrastructure initiative is focused not only on transportation infrastructure, but on energy infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, other, other assets that we need to invest in in our country. And clearly there are things we can do to bring in private equity to support accelerating projects. So there, there's an opportunity there. I think as the proposal is fleshed out more and, and shared, uh, we'll be able to have a more rich conversation about it. But clearly there are opportunities for streamlining projects. Clearly there are more opportunities for private sector involvement in projects, as we've seen occur in the public transportation industry in recent decades. Sort of building on that a little bit, um, how can we as an industry continue or improve um, how we partner with you to reinforce sort of some of those broader public transportation needs across the country? I think APTA members uh, have been articulate about the benefits of public transportation investment. Uh, many of you, uh, when you're making a large investment in say a fixed guideway, uh, you subsequently uh, document it. For us as a matter of law through a uh, before and after study, uh, talking about the impact of projects. And there's nothing more compelling than the real world examples of an investment uh, that delivered benefits. The challenge for all of us in the public transportation sector, as I think at the start of our conversation we noted, is that our investments do not always generate revenue streams back to the transit agency. And some of you have done thoughtful things to try and uh, develop systems to recapture some of that revenue, some of that value, those value capture measures. But being able to tell that story effectively, engaging uh, economists uh, and people to evaluate your projects and tell the story of the impact has been compelling. I think in conversations uh, with past and the current DOT leadership team, uh, those examples are, are important right now. Pat, did you? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, your ability to tell your story and sell it, it you know, if you can talk about the economic improvement that's happened in your area around your railroads um, is, um, is what will capture the public eye. And you're working together, as mentioned earlier, um, on projects so that you're, you're connecting city to city and, and uh, community to community, and you can talk about the synergy that you're going to achieve from that. Um, those are the dialogues that, that you can do, and those are the efforts that you can do that will continue to um, uh, promote your uh, position on it uh, and make it much more viable and much more interesting uh, to the government and to the American people who really you have to sell. So, um, so, so continue to sell what you're doing in advertising and make sure that people really understand the benefits from it. And then in the last thing is, is again, think a little bit outside of the box about not just purely uh, what, you know, how you're going to get the tracks in and move people, but what other, um, things you can do in terms of uh, revenue generation, whether it be how you handle parking, how you handle um, you know, uh, space for retail space. Um, and, and the closer you can get to a, a 
a, a, a positive uh, pro, uh, number closer to the profit level, the more um, you, your uh, position is uh, bolstered in, in the view of the, of the government. So, um, so keep selling it, keep working together, and think a little bit innovative. We have a question. On the administration's proposal to try to reduce the amount of time from concept to completion on projects from, say, 10 years down to two, uh, there's a potential for some low-hanging fruit, but when you look at the totality of, of planning, grant making, uh, initiation, design, uh, construction, uh, where do you see the big gains that would allow us to do something like that? In recent years, uh, we've seen for new starts, for capacity type projects, uh, our grantees, project sponsors, use a number of different methods for project delivery, right? So we've seen innovation in the space in terms of major capital project contracting, and some of those methods uh, have been able to deliver projects faster in a more integrated way. And you've all been uh, doing that uh, in, in a variety of, of contexts. So there are, there are project delivery approaches uh, that can be important. Certainly, smart application of environmental law and understanding uh, the law and how to meet the requirements to identify uh, you know, environmental impacts, to mitigate them, to carry it forward uh, is important. So we've seen where smart people come together, whether it's in the contracting space, whether it's in the environmental delivery process, uh, that projects can be accelerated. I'll tell you, right, we have FTA project sponsors who have come to us more than once with projects. Over time, they tend to build sophistication in project delivery and, unsurprisingly, they are labeled oftentimes to deliver projects faster than a new entrant, and it's because of what they learn. Having said that, I think uh, what we are looking at right now is not only how can we apply the existing rules more smartly, but are there things in our existing rules that we ought to change, that we ought to streamline or eliminate? And that is really the request that's on the table right now uh, to provide us with your insights as to where that might be. It's a question I think I would probably turn on the audience and ask you all to uh, give us feedback on uh, by the end of July. Yeah. Hey, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, just following up on that, Matt, I, I was wondering if you could articulate some of the things that you are working on under uh, MAP 21 and the FAST Act in terms of, of, of the project streamlining that was in those uh, two, two measures. Right. Yeah, there are some provisions in uh, MAP 21 and the FAST Act related to overall uh, project streamlining as well as uh, capital project streamlining. Uh, we do expect to have some more to say on that. Uh, there's a proposal, for example, or uh, Rob, there's a provision uh, related to uh, private investment uh, in partnerships that we hope to have something more to say about soon. So there are some tools that are already an existing statute uh, that we intend to, to open up uh, to our project sponsors and see where that might go. Plus some, there's some stuff that we're doing internally. For instance, um, you, it's no surprise to any of you out there that uh, there are more than one, um, each mode has a different environmental impact study process to go through. So we're looking to harmonize um, those processes to try to sort of get a stat, uh, one across DOT. And that's, uh, that's a project that's ongoing. Hopefully that'll come to fruition. Um, along with um, some Buy America harmonization and some other stuff out there so that you're not trying to work through three or four different processes um, because it does, uh, they often overlap. It could be a highway overlapping with a rail bridge, with overlapping with a transit area. So we're trying to make sure that we, we, we get to a, one process for you all and that's just one area and, and certainly you probably know a bunch more that you could tell us about that, that frustrate you and we'll, and we'll be glad to think about it. Well, that basically ram, wraps up the amount of time we have set aside for this discussion. I want to thank both Matt and Pat for coming and speaking, spending some time with us this afternoon and give us their insights. So with that, I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you.